Having only seen the enemy from far above and at great speeds, pilots still wonder about the effectiveness of the air war over Vietnam. This historical recreation shows what happened from a slower and closer point of view. During World War II, American planes sent by President Franklin Roosevelt bombed Japanese-occupied Vietnam. After the death of Roosevelt and the end of the war, President Harry Truman, fearing communist expansion, allowed the French to return to their former colony. In the north, Ho Chi Minh agreed to French military occupation, while in the south, Emperor Bo Dai was re-established as the French colonial ruler. Longing for total independence, Ho's Viet Minh guerrillas, later called the Viet Cong, began attacks on French forces. President Dwight Eisenhower, denied Allied approval to help the French, refused a request for U.S. combat air support at Dien Bien Phu. With the airstrip clearly within range of the Viet Minh artillery, the French were overrun and forced to surrender. While France's Laotian allies returned home, the victorious General Gap prepared for a formal French surrender in Hanoi. As French tanks left Hanoi, the Geneva Agreement of 1954 ended the war, dividing Indochina into Laos and Cambodia, with Vietnam divided north and south at the 17th parallel. North Vietnam celebrated freedom from foreign rule for the first time in hundreds of years with a homecoming parade for their jubilant soldiers. In Saigon, soldiers patrolled against religious forces hostile to Premier Diem, an anti-communist Catholic. On May 20th, 1955, nearly 40,000 Saigonese rallied in support of Premier Diem, who had deposed Emperor Dai. At last, both North and South Vietnam were independent countries. Unfortunately, China's Mao Zedong had earlier agreed to finance Ho Chi Minh's efforts to unite Vietnam into one communist country. Completely disregarding the Geneva Agreement, Russian and Chinese equipment and supplies were moved south through the mountainous trails of neutral Laos and Cambodia. When undefended villages were attacked in an effort to disrupt any honest elections for uniting Vietnam, Premier Diem and the United States refused to abide by the Geneva Accords, canceling the elections. By May 1961, Viet Cong guerrillas had attempted to cut off the supply of food to Saigon. As Saigon starved, the United States became obligated to help defend the newly formed Republic of South Vietnam against the northern onslaught. Seeking a counterinsurgency military force, President John F. Kennedy created the Army's elite special forces to advise Vietnamese ground infantry and Air Force jungle gyms to train South Vietnamese pilots. On November 16, 1961, the 440th Combat Crew Training Squadron arrived at Benoit Air Base under the codename Operation Farmgate. By June 1962, Farmgate had trained enough pilots to operate two fighter squadrons. In late 1962, over War Zone D, Farmgate pilots blocked enemy escape routes with rockets and 500-pound bombs. On January 2, 1963, Army advisors proceeded with an air mobile assault against a VC force near the village of Atbak. Even though Farmgate air cover had been scheduled for another operation, the 7th Arvin Division, expecting only 200 enemy troops, assaulted an entire VC battalion. Lightly armed UH 1B Hui gunships had little effect upon the superior force. Fortunately, a Vietnamese FAC, forward air controller, managed to divert the Farmgate fighters and a B-26 bomber armed with rockets and napalm to save the remainder of the 7th Division.
President Lyndon Johnson supported his predecessor's commitment to South Vietnam, but because of the Korean War experience was hesitant to follow his general's hard-hitting offensive recommendations. After the destroyer USS Maddox was attacked, Johnson had a smoking gun to present to the American public, which gave him a mandate for a more aggressive stance. He ordered his aircraft carriers Constellation and Ticonderoga into action. A 26-plane strike force from the Ticonderoga was prepared to attack the oil depot at Vinh and PT bases at Phuc Loi and Quang Chi. More aircraft from the Constellation were ordered to hit a naval installation at Lok Chau, and 20 planes were assigned to the northernmost city of Hong Gai. American RA-5 Vigilante hooked up to a steam-driven launch catapult. The launch order was given. Air traffic controllers directed the planes toward their respective missions from their carrier base at Yankee Station. America officially entered the air war in Vietnam with Operation Pierce Arrow, a series of reprisal strikes against targets in North Vietnam. Over Hong Gai, Lieutenant Alvarez, in his A-4 Skyhawk, walked a stream of 20-millimeter cannon fire along the coast. As he began to pull up, his cannons empty, he was hit by anti-aircraft fire. Pierce Arrow was a success for President Johnson. With his Gulf of Tonkin resolution approved by Congress, he pressed the attack into North Vietnam. But Lieutenant Alvarez bailed out to become the first POW for eight torturous years. Two squadrons of B-57 Canberra bombers were sent to the Benoit Air Base in South Vietnam. Capable of a 6,000-pound payload with a combat strike range of over 1,500 miles, these planes posed a definite threat to North Vietnam. On November 1, 1964, the Viet Cong fired nearly 80 rounds at the poorly defended Binh Hoa Air Base. Five bombers were destroyed and 13 damaged. In December 1964, while American advisors conducted village pacification programs, the Viet Cong began launching larger assaults against the government-controlled hamlets and military outposts. In a direct attack against the Americans, the VC planted a bomb in the U.S. Bachelor's Officer's Billet on Christmas Eve. At the village of Bin Gay, two VC regiments overran the government-controlled hamlet, then set up an ambush for the inevitable counterattack by government forces sent to reclaim the area. Depending upon only chopper gunships for air cover, Vietnamese ranger companies and marine battalions were cut to pieces by the well-planned ambush. By the time Farmgate fighters arrived, it was too late. This disaster prompted General Westmoreland to request U.S. jets for emergency ground support. Near Ply Coup at Camp Halloway and two Corps headquarters, BC bomb squads blew up 27 planes. In response, President Johnson ordered Flaming Dart 1 flights launched for the U.S. carriers Coral Sea, Hancock, and Ranger.
Their target, the port city of Dong Ho. Forced by low cloud cover to drop below 100 feet, Skyhawks pickled an anti-aircraft battery with 250-pound high-drag spring fin snake-eye bombs. Although wounded, Vietnamese Vice Air Marshal Key hit an anti-aircraft regiment headquarters. In retaliation for these brazen air attacks, the Viet Cong blew up a hotel in Quy Nhan. Planes were sent against an NVA complex at Chan Ho, while VNAF Sky Raiders struck an enemy barracks at Chap Lee. Three Navy jets were lost, two were unaccounted for, and one of the pilots, Lieutenant Commander Robert Schumacher, was captured. Near An Khe, an Arvin Ranger battalion and its American advisors were ambushed by the VC. For the first time, U.S. Air Force B-57s and F-100s were sent to the rescue. While the jets held back the enemy, U.S. Army Huey helicopters dropped in under fire and extracted the 220 survivors. After the ambush at An Khe, all restrictions on Air Force aircraft and pilots were lifted. American pilots had been eagerly awaiting the transmission of the order to begin Operation Rolling Thunder which was scheduled to progressively increase the air attacks against targets in the north. President Johnson had finally given up his defensive posture and began to press the attack, fully committing American forces to the support of the South Vietnamese ally. On March 2nd, the first Rolling Thunder mission, an ammo supply depot at Zom Bang, was launched from bases in Vietnam and Thailand. The timing for the massive air assault had broken down so that flights were stacking up over the target and surrounded by anti-aircraft batteries. A Korean War veteran, Lieutenant Colonel Reisner, serving as commander, managed to re-establish radio discipline and began to coordinate the inexperienced pilots. Although the target was destroyed, six planes were shot down. Colonel Reisner had to tell Lieutenant General Moore, commander of the 2nd Air Division, that the anti-aircraft defenses were stronger than they expected and they were going to lose some planes. On March 8, 1965, 3,500 Marines landed at Da Nang. Their mission was to establish a beachhead for unloading supplies and expand the existing airbase. The expansion included construction of a temporary catapult launch runway, which was later replaced by a jet-capable concrete runway. Because of bad weather, the second Rolling Thunder mission didn't take place until March 15th. During the next two weeks, Air Force and Navy pilots divided their time between armed reconnaissance missions against transportation targets and the larger Alpha strikes against bridges and radar sites. Although successful, these assaults in the southern panhandle frustrated the military, which sought permission to attack more substantial targets further north.
The Viet Cong responded to the second Rolling Thunder mission by planting 250 pounds of explosives in a black Citroen automobile at the American Embassy in Saigon. The car exploded just as Ambassador Taylor was leaving the embassy, killing two people and wounding 52. The president responded back by expanding LOC, or lines of communications targets, including roads, rolling stock, bridges, and supply bunkers up to the 20th parallel. Numbered Rolling Thunder route packages reduced inter-service duplication and omission and provided weekly targets that ascended north through the various zones. On April 3rd, a thunderous strike against the Than Ho, or Dragon's Jaw Bridge, started a month-long LOC campaign that sent waves of fighter bombers north. Although the Dragon's Jaw withstood the assault, by early May, 26 other bridges, seven ferries, and hundreds of trucks, locomotives, and boxcars had been destroyed. After a five-day bombing pause in mid-May, during which American diplomats tried in vain to establish contact with the North Vietnamese, Rolling Thunder resumed in earnest. In June, three VC regiments attacked a Green Beret camp at Dong Hai, and the C-47 flare ship and Vietnamese Sky Raiders rushed to the battle. Flares from the C-47 failed to penetrate the low cloud cover of 500 feet. Unable to see the enemy, the Vietnamese Sky Raiders returned to their base. Just before dawn, two U.S. Sky Raiders, responding to the desperate calls for help, threw away the book and broke in under the clouds and dropped their bombs in a low-level pass through a hail of automatic fire, stopping the enemy advance for a while. At dawn, the defenders still held on as planes hit machine guns while four battalions fought through VC ambushes. As one wounded GI put it, I owe my life to the Air Force. On June 17th, during another strike against the Dragon's Jaw Bridge, as F-105 fighter bombers made their passes below, two Phantoms from the USS Midway, flying defense, picked up the and K would be built up by the specially created 1st Air Cavalry Division, a uniquely trained unit of several kinds of chopper pilots and armor artillery and infantry companies. Men from the division's advance party chowed down while on the cramped 15 to 20 hour flight from the world in a C-141 Starlander. Having little sleep, the troops stepped out into a day of hectic deployment of initial equipment and defenses. An old C-47 was made into a capable night fighter with flares and three Gatling guns that blazed tracers every fifth round at 18,000 per minute. Nicknamed Puff the Magic Dragon, it lit up the dark, spewed out fire and smoke, and kept troops safe as it roared all night long. Whenever Choi Hoi surrender passes were scattered around a target, enemy officers would evacuate the area. They were used by deserters when malaria or starvation promised certain death. They were especially used in association with the most terrible and feared bomber of all, the B-52 Stratofortress on arc light missions. A captured North Vietnamese soldier described the silent death this way. One minute I was sitting on a hill eating breakfast, and then I was sitting on the edge of a crater as my entire regiment and half the hill just vanished without a sound. Then I heard the rolling thunder. 150, 750 pound bombs were dropped from planes cruising six miles up at 600 miles per hour, causing a mile long bomb trail of 20 by 30 foot craters. C-123s on Operation Ranch Hand sprayed defoliation chemicals such as Agent Orange around friendly base camps and roads to deny the enemy the concealment offered by a triple canopy jungle. In 1965, extensive use of this operation was also applied to VC compounds. A combat sky spot radar tracking compound relayed a hot pad alert signal to the fighter pilots in the ready room at Da Nang. Upon receiving the call, they headed for their F-102 Delta Daggers on a quick response mission. Yes, 
closer. H-43 rescue helicopter stood by as the crew prepared to leave for an emergency. On August 18th through the 21st, battalions from the 3rd, 4th, and 7th Divisions executed a classic Marine operation with air mobile helicopter units, infantry sweeps, naval guns, and a beachhead landing called Operation Starlight. Intended as a spoiling action against the Viet Cong buildup south of the Marine base camp at Chu Lai, the VC performed poorly in this first conventional ground battle. Marines flattened the usually successful ambush tactic by the VC with naval artillery. After capturing large amounts of ammunition, equipment, and prisoners, the Marines claimed 573 certified dead and reported 45 Allied casualties. Documents captured at a successfully defended Green Beret outpost at Play Me indicated that a large enemy force was advancing in the Idrang Valley. On October 27th, General Westmoreland ordered the 1st Air Cavalry to find, fix, and destroy the enemy. At a chopper landing zone, LZ X-Ray, the Air Mobile Infantry, ran into a vastly superior force, which they held back in spite of occasional hand-to-hand -hand fighting. As the CAV held their ground, fighter bombers, gunships, artillery, and B-52 strata fortresses pounded the perimeter of the LZ until a relief unit dropped into a nearby LZ and fought through the enemy to save the determined defenders. The success of this effort proved the Army had an effective new tactic in the air mobile search and destroy operation. As the ground forces advanced or blocked against the enemy, Forward air controllers, or FACs, in their Cessna O-1E bird dogs spotted enemy targets with smoke rockets for the combat support jets. A second bombing pause and peace negotiation effort from December 24th until January 28th produced only another hostile response from Hanoi. Maintenance crews and ordnance men were the unsung heroes who worked long hours to keep the more glamorous pilots in the air. Coordination of spare parts and ordnance components was extremely difficult because of partial deliveries that always required final assembly prior to placement on the aircraft. This problem was especially difficult for the bomb for more coordinated with the more maneuverable F-4 Phantoms as MiG defense and the faster F-105 Thunder Chiefs that could streak through the flak as hard to hit bombers. On June 29, 1966, Rolling Thunder missions against petroleum oil and lubrication or POL targets were launched, assigned the task of testing Hanoi's air defense system for the first time were the pilots of the Thailand-based 355th and 388th tactical fighter wings. After in-flight refueling from orbiting KC-135 tankers, the fighter bombers roared across the North Vietnamese countryside, diving through flak to release their bombs. Within minutes, enormous columns of thick black smoke towered 300 feet into the air. An 
estimated 60% of North Vietnam's entire POL supply was destroyed. Surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, built by Russia protected the target near Hanoi. The dreaded SAM-2 radar could be confused by splitting up the flight and diving below the 2,000-foot ceiling necessary for the high-speed missiles to stabilize. Deceptive MiG trap was planned, which sent F-4s along the same flight pattern as the F-105 bombers. Fooling enemy radar into assuming the blips were only helpless bombers, the trap worked perfectly. Once a plane went down, it was the job of the U.S. Air Force's 3rd Aerospace Rescue and Recovery Group to coordinate search and rescue, SAR missions. Stationed at bases throughout South Vietnam and Thailand, elements of the 3rd ARG initially relied on the enormous HH-3 Jolly Green Giant rescue helicopters. With a squadron of A-1 Sky Raiders, SAR helicopter crews rescued pilots in South Vietnam and deep into Laos and North Vietnam in some cases risking their lives to snatch downed airmen from within miles of Hanoi. Throughout the course of the war, SAR missions rescued 80% of all U.S. aviators shot down over North Vietnam and Laos who successfully ejected and contacted friendly forces. In all, between 1964 and 1973, search and rescue crews saved the lives of 3,883 men, nearly half of them U.S. airmen. Forward air controllers became very competent at bird-dogging the enemy on successful search-and-destroy missions. American infantry on the offensive cleared the jungles of well-hidden underground compounds used as staging areas for North Vietnamese and VC regiments, sweeping them into air and artillery fire. At War Zone C in the Iron Triangle, Operations Cedar Falls and Junction City represented the largest American-led ground sweep of the entire war. While infantry and armor battalions drove the enemy into the blazing air and artillery fire, an airborne assault parachuted an entire division into blocking positions as the enemy attempted to escape the closing net. Numerous underground facilities were discovered and cleared of booby traps, then destroyed by special groups of small, courageous men called tunnel rats.
After completely defeating the enemy forces, causing them to withdraw to sanctuary in neutral Cambodia and Laos, the mission was completed. Specially designed F-105 wild weasels with radar finding equipment were assigned to knock out the deadly anti-aircraft positions over Hanoi. On March 10th, Captain Merlin Deflipson, in his wild weasel, locked onto the target when he was hit by two MiGs. Losing them by diving into the flak, he found two more on the other side. With his wings riddled with bullets, he dived in again, attacking with bombs and 20 millimeter cannons. Finally, the target was destroyed. Rolling Thunder missions advanced into the restricted zones of Haiphong and Hanoi, destroying major railroad bridges and industrial facilities. On May 19th, the generator was struck. On October 25th, the MiG airbase at Fukien was hit. Dragon's Jaw Bridge and another generator were hit on December 14th and 15th. One week later, a Christmas truce stopped the bombing. As always, whenever the bombing stopped, the Viet Cong moved equipment and supplies south down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, this time in preparation for the Tet Offensive. North Vietnamese soldiers prepared for strikes against Khe Sanh as well. Khe Sanh, located in a mountainous region usually covered by clouds that made airstrikes difficult, was prepared for the onslaught of the offensive being launched from the north. Reinforcements were sent in by General Westmoreland. The VC attack began with mortar rounds hitting the base. General Giap sent three NVA divisions, an estimated 20,000 men, who soon surrounded the side. of orbiting planes to bomb the perimeter around the base. Sorties were launched by both the Air Force and Naval Forces. But the thing that broke the back of the enemy was the B-52 Stratofortress. Directed by Skyspot triangulation radar beams, these bombers were accurate within 50 kilometers of the perimeter. As the B-52 held off the onslaught, supplies continued to drop to the troops since, by this time, the VC Rangers had the base within the range of their cannon. The accuracy of the B-52s was fantastic, hitting within three quarters of a mile from friendly forces, breaking the siege on Quezon. The first cavalry troops were able to break through to relieve the Marines. The battle was a decisive one, capturing much equipment and many prisoners. However, the attack at Khe Sanh was an operation to divert Allied attention from the Tet Offensive that attacked hamlets and villages within South Vietnam's interior. 
fighter bombers fought back with low flying strikes. And secret bombing attacks proceeded along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, trying to hold back the steadily advancing northern forces while F-105s hit radar sites along the trail with strike missiles. Vietnam's forces were devastated by the aerial counterattack. As a final inducement to Hanoi for an honorable settlement, President Johnson halted the bombing again and declared that he would not run for the presidency. Surprisingly, North Vietnam sent representatives to the Paris peace talks. But while the peace talks bogged down, the VC continued to build up their forces and conduct ambushes in the south. A year later, the second Tet Offensive was aimed directly at American facilities throughout South Vietnam. Once again, bombers and infantry soldiers drove them back to Cambodia and Laos. In response, President Richard Nixon, following the advice of his Joint Chiefs of Staff, ordered complete saturation bombing by B-52s of 94 targets in Laos and Cambodia. of the bombers, F-4 MiG fighters cleared paths of safety. On one such mission, Captain Stephen Ritchie and Captain Charles de Bellevue knocked out three MiGs. Captain Richard S. Ritchie of the 555th Tactical Fighter Squadron became the first Air Force ace on August 27, 1972. The backseater, Captain Charles D. de Bellevue, became an ace with six kills on September 9, 1972.
Captain Jeffrey S. Feinstein became an ace on October 13, 1972. Two Navy pilots, Lieutenant Randy Cunningham and Lieutenant William Driscoll, became the first air aces of the war while flying over the Haidong Railroad east of Hanoi on May 10, 1972. When the North Vietnamese delegation left the Paris peace talks in a huff, President Nixon approved Operation Linebacker II, known as the 11-Day War. The B-52s pounded Hanoi and Haiphong until they had no more MiGs left and no anti-aircraft forcing Hanoi to return to the peace talks the day following the complete destruction of all their air defenses. Henry Kissinger, chief negotiator for the Americans in Paris, announced, peace is at hand. <laughs> 